Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Jeremy da Silva. He is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Dartmouth College. He is a paleoanthropologist specializing in the locomotion of the first apes, hominoids, and early human ancestors, hominins. He is the editor of a recent book, A Most Interesting Problem, What Darwin's Descent of Man Got Right and Wrong About Human Evolution. And we're going to talk about that book today because it marks the 150th anniversary of Darwin's Descent of Man. So, Dr. De Silva, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be here, Ricardo. Okay, great. So, let me first ask you, what are some of the biggest ideas that were introduced by Darwin in his descent of men that perhaps were absent from the origin of species or were presented there but were more elaborated upon in the descent of men? Oh, that's a that's a great question. I mean, most folks know of Charles Darwin as um, the 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 individual who was able to articulate the mechanism of evolution, right? He didn't he didn't invent evolution. He was able to hypothesize that natural selection was the mechanism. It was the driver behind evolution, and he did this um, in Origin of Species, which is just a brilliantly written, um, accessible book. He he didn't read it, write it necessarily for his colleagues, although you know they they were interested too. Um, he he wrote it in a way that everyone could understand, uh, and this was in 1859. But he said very 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 little about humans. Uh, he, you know, there are examples brought up throughout the book that, that involve humans, and at the very end of the book, he talks about um, uh, shedding light on the origin of, of humans, that this uh, understanding of evolution would, would do just that. <clears throat> and then he left it at that. Uh, he didn't actually dive into the origin of, of humans at all. Uh, and it took 12 years uh, for him, and, and there were other projects involved. He wrote a book on, on basic variation of domestic plants and animals. Uh, he was very interested in pollinators um, and worked on a manuscript about pollinators. Uh, you know, he was interested in climbing plants um, and, and wrote about that. So this is a guy who was interested in so, so much. Um, and I admire, I so admire his, his curiosity. But with Descent of Man, it was the application of some of those same principles from Origin of Species to the big question of where did we come from? Uh, you know, let's dive in. Let's, let's, you know, if evolution is going to explain life on Earth, it's going to also explain uh, the origin and evolution of humans. The other big idea that he presented in Descent of Man that was new was something called sexual selection. Uh, think about a peacock, for instance, a male peacock with those elaborate feathers. Natural selection is not going to favor an animal that has ornamentation like that because a predator will spot that animal and be able to catch it and eat it very well. Male peacocks are actually hindered in their locomotion and their flight by those uh, those ridiculous feathers. So what are those feathers doing? Well, they're 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 attracting a female. And so in Descent of Man, it's almost like two books in one, where he has this second whole section on uh, this other mechanism of evolutionary change, which is, which is sexual selection. And then he tries to apply that principle to humans. Um, and, and he does it with, with some, uh, there are some errors. Um, now that we, you know, 150 years later, we can look back on it and say, well, that didn't, that didn't quite work. Um, and we explore that in, in, in our book. Mm -hmm. Right. But is it that some of these ideas, new ideas that Darwin presented in The Descent of Men, were they originally his or did they come from other people that perhaps put them forth between the publication of The Origin of Species and The Descent of Men or even perhaps before that? Yeah. So, so Darwin was quite influenced by a, a lot of thinkers around him. Um, and Darwin had amazing correspondences around the world with other scholars, and he had a close relationship with um, Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, who was another researcher who independently developed the idea of uh, natural selection. Uh, and, and in fact, he and Darwin co-authored the first um, announcement of uh, evolution by means of natural selection 
uh, when when uh, they were presenting it in front of a committee in in, in London. Um, Darwin's uh, so Alfred Russell Wallace had had produced a manuscript on on human uh, evolution. Um, uh, uh, Darwin's other uh, colleagues, uh, a, a geologist by the name of Charles Lyell, had written a book about human evolution. Um, and then Darwin's, uh, Darwin's bulldog uh, had written a book on, on human evolution as, as well. And so Darwin was very much influenced by the work that others were, were, were producing. Um, but he had some things to say, too. He very much disagreed with Wallace. Uh, on his interpretation of the human brain. So Wallace, for instance, thought that we can understand human origins and evolution through this means of natural selection, but not the brain, that the brain was just too complex. And Darwin was, was disturbed by this and thought, no, 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 we actually we can, that the human brain um, is not a, a different in kind to these brains of other organisms. It's just an extent uh, that, that we are patterned after these other mammals, primates, uh, and, and apes. And so I think Darwin used uh, the work that others had done uh, uh, as, as a launching pad uh, to then produce his, his own work uh, in 1871. Mm -hmm. But this idea of applying evolutionary theory to humans, was it something that Darwin already into that in the origin of species or was it something that was, uh, I mean, sort of a novel idea introduced in the descent of men? So, you know, I'm not a Darwin historian, so I, it's hard for me to, to, to know um, all of the, you know, all of his letters, all the things he wrote. Um, but my understanding is that Darwin very much um, knew the implications of of evolution by means of natural selection and it did apply to humans um that we were an animal like anything else um and he understood this way back um you know it, it, some of some of his observations and experiences that he had when he was traveling around the world on the beagle um you, you know decades earlier already were influencing and framing his way of, of thinking about about the world and so as he started writing when he returned to england and never again really left the, the british isles as he as he was writing um and thinking about the 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 evidence uh for natural selection um yes he absolutely was considering how it how it affected um or how it could be used to explain the human condition uh and this is years before he even wrote origin um, but my understanding is that um, is that he wanted to produce a book in in, in origin uh, that wasn't distracting, um, and that we could get right to the scientific mechanism. And look, humans are emotional. Humans, when when we're the ones we're talking about, it's hard not to introduce bias. It's hard not to have emotions get involved. Um, and so, having I think it was a brilliant move on his part to have the origin of species really not address the human condition let it settle, let the scientific community debate the merits of the idea, uh, the pros and cons, you know, what evidence will we continue to seek to, to, to evaluate this novel idea? Uh, and then a decade later, it's, hey, by the way, folks, this has implications for humans uh, a, a, as, as well. Um, and so it was a natural follow-up, um, but I think he was, he, you know, it was a wise decision on his part to have those two ideas and those two books separated in time. Um, and also, you know, by the time he wrote Descent of Man, he was such an established uh, member of the scientific community that his ideas had more weight um, and, and they would be taken more, more seriously. I think if he had written about human origins and evolution uh, before that time, when he was still sort of a, a younger scientist that didn't necessarily have the credibility uh, the ideas might have been might have been dismissed. Right. So to get a little bit more into the content of the book, in part one of the book, it talks a lot about human mental faculties. It talks about language, reason, morality, consciousness, religion, memory, imagination. So, uh, I mean, are there any common threads in his evolutionary rationale that connect? 
all of these human mental faculties together or does he approach them on a case by case basis to try to try to explain their evolutionary origins that's a great question um our our contributors in those chapters um uh, susanna herculano huzel and brian Hare do an amazing job of um, synthesizing what Darwin wrote, but then also updating it with, well, what do we know today, 150 years later? Um, and one of the things that, that, that there, there, there are two things that, I, that, that I'll say about that section of the book. Um, the first is that um, Darwin is able to take, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the really extraordinary things, if we, if we sort of ask ourselves, what is the most amazing thing about being human? Um, I think most people will talk about the brain and, and language that will say, you know, and, and maybe our creativity and our, and our, and our artwork and, and, you know, you know, what really separates us from the other animals um, is, is, is centered in our, in the way we think, uh, our creativity, right, our language, um, our spirituality, all these things, our morality, some, some might, might argue. Um, and Darwin hit that right up front. This is what was amazing to me is, is, I think a lot of authors these days um, would build an argument and then end with the brain and sort of say, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to present all of the evidence I have for human evolution and that we are just like other animals and in, 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 you know, that we're, you know, uh, of course we're, we have our unique characteristics, but uh, that, that we have undergone the same sort of um, uh, selection pressures to, to uh, evolve these specialized ca characteristics like other animals do in their, in their environments. Um, and then it would build to the really special things that make us human, right? And he doesn't. He hits this right up front. He says, okay, Wallace thinks that the, the brain is um, unexplainable through natural selection. I'm going to show you why it is explainable. And not only that, I'm going to show you why language is understandable. I'm going to show you why spirituality, morality, and, 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 and uh, adoption of, of religious thinking is, is understandable through this, this lens. And so he takes care of the really difficult stuff right up front, um, which I deeply admire. Uh, and, and, you know, it was a risk and it was, it was quite a, a courageous thing to do, uh, I, I think, to address those issues right up, right up front. But the, the other thing is that this is how he establishes um, that humans are another animal, is by connecting us, our brains, our language, our, our you know, the decision making, our morality. He connects us through, uh, through data, but also through these beautiful anecdotes to other animals and says, look, you know, we're not that different from, uh, from apes, of course, and from monkeys, but also from the behavior of, of a dog and the behavior of these other animals that maybe the readers are more familiar with and the decisions that they go through and the brains that they have, um, it's just a difference of extent. And so that is such a key um, theme throughout Darwin's writing is that yes, humans are, are amazing, um, but we're not specially created, that, that we evolve just like these other things, and therefore, there are gonna be these connections to these other things, and that all of life on Earth is connected uh, through common ancestry. And so I think it's a, it's a really beautiful um, idea that Darwin gives us, and that the evidence uh, strongly supports that, that we are related to uh, all of life uh, on, on Earth, of course, more closely related to things like apes and monkeys and primates and more closely related to mammals than we are to fish, but we're even related to fish and we're even related to plants uh, if you go back far enough to the common ancestor. So that connection to these other living organisms, he really establishes right off the bat in the beginning of the book. So uh, since you're an anthropologist and anthropology is one of those disciplines we resort to when we're trying to know more about human behavior, human sociality, human nature, let's say, uh, do you think that back then perhaps there would have been already some anthropological work done that would have something to say about these human mental faculties Darwin tackles on the book that perhaps he might have missed, wasn't aware of, or not? At that time, um, that's a really good question. At that time, anthropology was just being established as a discipline. Um, 
there were ethnographies beginning to be uh, um, written uh, ar around, around that, that time. Um, I think when it comes to biological anthropology, uh, we turned to Huxley. Huxley was doing most of the uh, the, the the work in terms of um, a comparison of say brains between different uh, primates and different and different apes, and Darwin did use that information. In fact, he expanded on that in his second edition of Descent of Man. Um, you know, that's what I one of the things I love about Darwin's writing is now that I've written a book. Um, the idea of a second edition is sort of um, <laughs> overwhelming to me, and he. Um, uh, no, he, he would write these second editions, and with Origin of Species, he got up to fifth, uh, five editions um, because he understood the importance of self-correction. He understood that science is a mechanism by which we understand our world through evidence, and that evidence is going gonna, is gonna to change as more people are asking questions and going out and testing ideas. So you need to update your ideas. Um, and change your mind if if the evidence uh, uh, points in that in that direction, and so I love that he was right, you know uh, correcting his own ideas and writing uh, um, different editions uh, 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 to his to his volumes through time. Um, but right, so you have you have Cox, uh, Huxley who was doing some really important brain work. The paleoanthropological community, which is what I'm uh, mostly familiar with, um, again a brand new discipline. Um, the earliest fossils that we now know are, come from Neanderthals uh, were discovered in 1831 in Belgium. And so they were available to, to Darwin, but they were dismissed as just, you know, nor, you know, just old humans, old people. Um, in 1864, things changed a little bit. Uh, and this is before Dar Descent of Man, 1864, uh, William King, uh, worked on a skeleton found in Germany and proposed that this skeleton was, it was found in a, in a, in a valley called the Neander Valley in Germany. And he proposed that this was a different species of human that he called Neanderthal or Homo Neanderthalensis. And so this idea was beginning to come out as Darwin was writing this book. And in fact, I start the book with this scene. Um, Darwin was, was ill for much of his adult life and he went to, to London um, to spend some time away from Downhouse, which is where he spent most of his time. And while he was there, uh, a, a paleontologist, a Scottish paleontologist by the name of Falconer, brought to him a skull. And it was, it was a skull that was discovered in Gibraltar. Um, and, and I've got a replica of it that I'm showing Ricardo now. Um, and the, the, the skull itself um, was presented to Darwin, and he was quite ill at the time, so maybe he was distracted by that. Um, and he observed the skull. He, the only line that he wrote about it that we're aware of is in a in a letter, um, and in it he he refers to the the wonderful wonderful Gibraltar skull, um, but he doesn't include it in Descent of Man, which is so interesting that he, that. Charles Darwin held in his hand the skull of a Neanderthal and, and didn't recognize the importance of it at, at, at the time. Um, and so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't blame him for that. Um, I mean, there are probably things in my career that I've held in my, my hand um, that, you know, years later, somebody's going to make some great discovery about that. And I'm going to say, geez, I didn't even notice that. Um, you know, science is done by humans, and humans are are pretty amazing, and we make great observations, and we ask great questions, um, but we miss things, um, and that's 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 part part of the you know that's part of the humanity of science. Yeah, and in terms of the sorts of hypotheses he put forth, in terms of our evolutionary origins, for example, I think that back then. He also suggested that we might have originated in Africa, right? He did. He did. He did. There is this amazing page in Descent of Man. Um, it's page 199. And it's as though for that one moment he had a time machine. And he could, he could predict all of these things about human evolution that end up that end up 
being, we think, as, as the evidence is, is demonstrating to us right now, we think he's right. And in one of those things, and, and again, this is without the thousands of fossils we now have. It's without any evidence from DNA. You know, molecular genetics wasn't, wasn't a thing. We didn't know how old these fossils were. There's so much uh, future science to come. And here he was in, in 1871, putting out down on paper that, that humans are most closely related to chimpanzees and gorillas. And, and he was right. There are re researchers at the time saying, no, 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 no. They're more related to the Asian apes, orangutans and gibbons, or even that we are our own separate branch. And we're, we're you know, yes, we're related to the apes, but, but it would be equally related to, the, to all of them. Um, and Darwin said, no, 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 it's the African apes, uh, chimpanzees and, and gorillas. Now we now know it's even with more resolution that, it, that it's chimpanzees. Um, gorillas are our second cousins. And because chimpanzees and gorillas live in Africa, he, he reasoned that the origin of our lineage would be, would be there as well. And sure enough, 150 years later, we have thousands and thousands of early human fossils. Um, and, and where are the oldest ones from? They're from Africa. Uh, we, we do not find fossils of early humans outside of Africa until you get to something called Homo erectus, which evolved about 2 million years ago and then expanded its territory and spread out into Eurasia um, and went as far you know, east as Indonesia and as far west as, as, as Spain um, and perhaps even Portugal. Um, there are no, no Homo erectus fossils there yet, <laughs> um, but, but why not, right? So, uh, so Darwin um, uh, in, in that chapter made some brilliant observations and predictions on the basis of, of very little evidence, but he was able to reason some things together. One of the other um, great observations he made was he sort of said, okay, how are humans different from our close living relatives? And, and, and remember, this is long before Jane Goodall. This is long before we had primatologists out there actually collecting data on our relatives. So all we could know about them uh, was really observations from zoos, uh, or, or some, some really uh, fanciful accounts from, from the field. And uh, Darwin said, okay, wh what's different between us and them? Well, of course we have bigger, bigger brains, okay? Uh, we have smaller canine teeth. We have a greater reliance on, on technology. Um, he does make observations of, of chimpanzees using tools, um, but, uh, but still, you know, we have a greater reliance on, on technology and we move differently. We walk on two legs, whereas they walk on all fours. And Darwin saw these four things as being connected. And he argued that they evolved in concert pretty much, that those individuals who happened to move on two legs freed the hands. And with freed hands, you could make tools. And if you're butchering a carcass with tools, you don't need those canine teeth anymore. So those canines begin to reduce in, 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 in size as they, you know, they would be energetically costly to maintain. So those individuals with smaller canines survive better because they've got tools now. Uh, and, and with those tools, you can extract more resources from your environment and you start to get brain expansion. So Darwin's idea of human evolution was very much one in which these features that separate us and the apes evolve in concert with with each other uh, with maybe upright walking being the trigger being the starting point where once we evolve that uh, then you can free your your hands and use tools okay so this is a hypothesis right just like you said and we can test it with the evidence we currently have and what we find is that he's off he, he's he's right he's right about those four things being distinct to humans great observations, but he's wrong about the timing. Now, how could he possibly have known? He, he couldn't have. Um, you need a fossil record to really unpack that. And we have that fossil record now. And what we know is that upright walking comes first, it, it, as Darwin sort of hinted at. It long precedes, though, the origin of stone tools. Stone tools, uh, the first upright walkers we find in the fossil record are about six million years old. And the origin of stone tools in the archaeological record uh, goes back about 3 million years. So, so 3 million years pass 
where our ancestors are moving on two legs-ish, climbing trees quite a bit too, but moving on two legs, but not making the kinds of stone tools that Darwin predicted uh, they were doing with these, these freed hands. Canine reduction was happening, but then brains come much later. Brains don't begin to expand until about two million years ago. So this is a great example of how Darwin laid out a hypothesis. Modern science can test that idea with more evidence than he had, and we can show ways in which he was right and ways in which he was wrong. And as a scientist, I think he'd be thrilled by that. Oh, I, you know, I would love more than anything to show Charles Darwin a skeleton of Lucy. You know, it's a skeleton of an Australopithecus. I think it would blow his mind that such a creature uh, existed. I think he'd be so thrilled by it. Yeah, but, but just to make this point clear, the reason why he put forth an hypothesis saying that we are of African descent was by comparing us to other great apes that were African, right? I mean, he, he didn't have, That's right. uh, he didn't have a, really access to the sort of, uh, I mean, to the sort of data, paleoanthropological data that we have now and to the fossil remains, because, for example, uh, with the African, with the out of Africa migrations by Homo erectus, it could have happened that Homo sapiens would have evolved in in any place outside Africa. I mean, Eurasia or Oceania, for example. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and the, the evidence we, we have right now, both genetic and fossil, would, would still position Homo sapiens within within Africa as well uh, as a pan a pan African. Uh, um, uh, origin. Um, but you are, yes, that is absolutely right. He did not have access to any of that fossil information whatsoever. Um, and so his prediction that the origin of the human lineage would be African was entirely based on the fact that the close living relatives to humans were African. And I've always wondered, and this is something that sort of remains a mystery to me, um, is how did he reach that point where he determined that chimpanzees and gorillas are more closely related to humans than, say, orangutans are. Because a couple of years earlier, in 1867, he, he charted out a family tree of primates. And this is long before DNA, right? He doesn't have any genetic evidence to actually uh, test his ideas of who's related to whom. All he can base this on uh, are, are, is, is uh, anatomical comparisons, skeletal comparisons, some brain comparisons that Huxley had done, uh, behavioral comparisons that he knew about. Um, and in his family tree, uh, again, this is 1867, in his family tree, what he has are humans, equally related to uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons. And somewhere in those four years, between 1867 and 1871, he changed his mind. And he determined that humans are actually more closely related to gorillas and, and chimpanzees. Um, I have not been able to figure out what triggered that. Um, and maybe a Darwin historian would, would, would be able to uh, to answer that question for me. I think it's a fascinating one. Something changed his mind and changed his mind. Like this is a big change to suddenly nest humans within the African group um, and make this prediction that turns out to be, to be quite accurate. Um, it's, it's startling to me, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure what triggered it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but even if we know nowadays that we came from Africa, isn't it the case that more specific questions, like for example, if we had one single uh, African origin, or if we came or we evolved from several different regions in Africa, is that uh, that still debated? Right, is not completely settled. Oh, Ricardo, nothing settled. Yeah, we're, we, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we are finding new fossils all the time uh, in, in time periods and in places that we wouldn't have predicted. Um, and so I still, you know, we're still a very young science. And so we're still making these discoveries that are, um, that, that, that are, that are pretty awesome and pretty surprising. Um, and so look, you, you know, you work with the evidence you have and what we currently have um, is is the the earliest earliest fossils that have been identified as coming from the human lineage we call them hominins they go back six or seven million years this is right at the base of the tree where we split off from the ancestors with chimpanzees um those are those are from africa but 
right before then, uh, 8 million, 9 million, 10 million, what we find are that those apes, the ancestors of the African apes and humans, um, hug the Mediterranean. Uh, what is today the Mediterranean, at the time we call it the, 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 the Tethys Sea. And so you find ape fossils in Spain and France and Greece and Italy. There's a new one from Germany, uh, Hungary and Turkey. So apes used to live in Southern Europe. They used to live around the Mediterranean. And so there are some hypotheses, some arguments that maybe the split between the different African apes, including our own lineage uh, might have occurred in populations that were hugging the Mediterranean. And so, you know, when we talk about Africa or Europe and Asia, it's really arbitrary. These apes don't care where they are, right? They just want to eat fruit and survive and reproduce. Um, and so, so might it be that those, those populations, you know, hugged the Mediterranean and, and were, were in Africa and in Southern, what we call Southern Europe today? Yeah, that, that could very well be. We'll see as we find more fossils. Now, if you jump much later in time to the origin of our own species, Homo sapiens, um, the oldest ones we find, the oldest fossils and the genetics would point towards uh, an African origin, again, a pan-African origin, not any one spot, uh, but instead you find populations in South Africa and Ethiopia and Morocco exchanging genes. But there's a really old Homo sapiens fossil recovered recently from Greece. And so once again, it might very well be that these populations had pushed a little bit north uh, into, into around the Mediterranean region. Um, and we shouldn't be scared by that. I mean, these, these, uh, these humans were just trying to survive, right? They were just trying to go where food was. It's not like when they reached some arbitrary border that we've drawn today, uh, some some political border, uh, they said, oh, whoa, whoa, I can't cross here. I can't go and eat food over there because, you know, then I'll be leaving this continent. Um, that's not really how it works. So I think, I think, it, I think the, you know, the origins of our, of our species, our lineage, our genus, these are things that are going to become much more nuanced and frankly, much more interesting as we find more fossils. Right. Would you say that Darwin had any direct impact on the development of your field, paleoanthropology? Yeah. So, so, you know, Darwin um, set the stage with his ideas, with his curiosity, um, with the hypotheses he proposed, with the questions he asked, with the observations he made. You know, there are now thousands and thousands and thousands of scientists around the world um, who are asking questions that are the more mature version, the more advanced version, the with 150 years of information under our belts now, uh, those kinds of questions that really can trace a lot of their foundations back to, back to Darwin. And so, yes, uh, Darwin had this massive impact um, on our field. Now, when I'm writing, you know, some paper about, uh, you know, a, a, a fossil leg bone, I, you know, we've discovered or something like that, do I start with Darwin? No, not necessarily, right? Because Darwin didn't contribute necessarily to that conversation. But any sort of big picture argument about the origin of, say, bipedalism, um, Darwin spoke on that. Darwin talked about that. Uh, anything that is addressing the question of, you know, what did the common ancestor look like? Well, Darwin warned us that the common ancestor of any two species is not going to look like either of them. That it's going to be something, not some, not some morphing blend of the two, but something more generalized from which those populations diverge. Um, and so, when we found, you know, as a field, when my colleagues discovered what's called Artipithecus ramidus, and it was a, a peculiar hominin, didn't quite look like what anyone would have predicted necessarily, uh, Darwin got quoted in that, that paper saying, look, you know, he, he said this, and now we have a fossil uh, that is actually confirming some of, some of those, those words. So no doubt, I, I don't think you'd be able to find a biological anthropologist or a biologist or even a geologist uh, who could say that they weren't, they haven't been influenced by, uh, by the words of Darwin. Mm -hmm. By the way, when you study our evolutionary origins, uh, 
in paleoanthropology, how far back in evolutionary history do you go? Do you stop at our common ancestor with chimpanzees? Do, do you stop at the great apes or do you, do you go even far back than that? So personally, um, a, a, as a scientist, what I do is uh, I'm very interested in, in early hominins like Lucy and her kind, Australopithecus, but right. to understand them, it's good to know what they evolved from. And so that takes you back to what we call Ardipithecus and then to the common ancestor that we share with chimpanzees. But then I wanna know what those things evolved from. So that takes you back even farther into a time period called the Miocene. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about and researching the Miocene apes. These are some of those apes that were living around the Mediterranean. Uh, so I was in Germany a couple of years ago looking at a new discovery from, from there. Um, and then I'm also interested in the origin of the apes. Where did apes come from? Why did apes evolve at all? Um, and so that takes you back 20 million years to the origin of apes. And that appears to be uh, also African. Uh, the oldest ape fossils that we discover uh, are, are in the Great Rift Valley in Eastern Africa, uh, in Uganda and in, and in Kenya. Um, so I've, I've done work there. Now, is that where apes evolved? Probably not. That's where we can find fossils of that, the, of, of the early ancestors of, of the apes. Um, there are colleagues of mine who take it back even farther than that. And they say, okay, well, what did the common ancestor of monkeys and apes look like? And that takes you back about 35 million years. And there are sites in Egypt that help understand that. Other colleagues of mine want to know the origin of primates. Where did, you know, how did primates come to be and how do they diversify? Uh, and that takes you, interestingly, to sites in Asia uh, and uh, in, even in North America. So there are fossil sites in Wyoming um, of some early, early uh, primates. So primates used to live in, in, in North America. Um, and then of course, uh, the, the continents were connected in a slightly different way at the time. And you can get the movement of those animals across uh, from the Americas into, into Asia and even into, into Europe. Uh, but then uh, as, as uh, the forest changed, as there was climate change, uh, you start to get the forest uh, retracting back into areas in Asia and in Africa, uh, which is why we find primates there today and why we find a lot of the fossils of uh, primates uh, hugging those in the environments uh, in sediments in the, what we would call the plyo Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. So there's no single point in evolution where paleoanthropologists say that, okay, this already falls outside of, of the purview of uh, anthropology and this is something for biologists, evolutionary biologists to deal with. Not, not really. No, I mean, we um, as anthropologists, many of us are trained as as biologists. You know, my degree was in, or as an undergraduate was in biology. Um, so many of us, you know, are trained as physiologists or ecologists or some are geologists. Um, and because we're interested in questions related to humans and human origins and evolution, uh, we end up finding jobs most frequently in either anatomy departments, teaching med students or in anthropology departments. And that, that's where I've, I've found myself, um, even though my, you know, the questions I ask, um, you know, <laughs> take me into, into places that are quite different from what my uh, uh, colleagues in sociocultural anthropology and what, what, you know, the work that they do and the questions that they ask about humans living today. Um, but, you know, I, I, I learned, I learned recently not to have those arbitrary cutoffs because, um, I'm very interested in, in the evolution and origins of upright walking. And so by the time you get to what's called the Pleistocene, that's about two and a half million years ago up to today. Uh, well, not quite up to about uh, uh, 10,000 years ago. Um, the, the fossils that we had would signify that, um, that all of those hominins living at that time, Homo erectus and then eventually Neanderthals and modern humans, we're all more or less walking like we do today. Maybe some subtle variants on it, but it's just subtle. And so I was never interested in the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene I thought was boring. I was like, ah, they're just humans, right? Um, okay, in the last 15 years, there was this discovery of something called Homo floresiensis, or the hobbit, found in Indonesia. 
which is only about 90,000 years old, 50 to 90,000 years old. And it has this bizarre leg and foot that would signify that it was, it was, it was walking very differently. And then I worked on a project a couple of years ago in South Africa on a collection of fossils that are called Homo naledi. They were discovered deep in a cave and it looks like they were deliberately put there after individuals died in the group, they were, they were put in the cave. And um, their, their bones are also bizarre and would indicate another kind of hominin walking in a different kind of way. And I thought they, would, they were gonna be quite ancient and they're not, they're only a quarter of a million years old. And so, um, yeah, my cutoff used to be the, you know, I used to say, all right, I'm interested in the Pliocene, you know, from, from two and a half to five million years ago. And now I find myself working on projects well into the Pleistocene. And so, you know, you, you follow your interest, even if it crosses these boundaries of time and, and space, you know, here I am working at sites in Germany now. Um, I never, I never would have predicted that. Yeah. So before we move on to talking a little bit about sexual selection, uh, about these human mental faculties, as he calls them in the book, uh, Darwin. So would, uh, did he consider the role that culture might play in the evolution of those faculties? Or did he even consider culture as another one of those mental faculties? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, Darwin does talk about culture quite a bit. And um, he, um, in chapter five in, in his book, uh, he makes some errors that, that, again, at the time, how is he to know? But looking, looking back on it, in, in, as we reflect, you know, 150 years later, um, there, there are some errors that, that we think he's, he's made where he is conflating biological evolution with cultural evolution. And he's, a, he's conflating sort of the exchange of, of ideas with the exchange we now know would be the exchange uh, in, in genes. And it's where he begins to, um, he begins to, to kind of fall off the rails a little bit of his own creation, his own rails. One of the, one of the beauties of Darwin, one of the things that I so appreciate um, is how he was able to um, think outside the box and convert what everyone had been thinking about for, for literally since, since the time of Aristotle, the great chain of being, that organisms could be ranked and at the top was, was human, and not only human, but, but man was at, was at the top, right? And then below us were all these other, other organisms. And, and people today still think this way. They still think about you know, the, the human, then the ape, then the monkey, then the rat, then the lizard, then the frog, then the fish. And Darwin said, no, 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 no. Frogs and fish live today. They're at the tips of a branching tree connected through these different branches through time. And so I read Darwin and what I see is everything living today, if it's a butterfly or a bird or, 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 a, or a monkey or a human, um, everything living today is equally evolved, that it is at the tips of these branches, it has survived all of the rigors of natural selection that it faced through its evolutionary journey and its own local ecology and that all of these things share common ancestry through time. So I always am telling my students, you know, don't think of this like a ladder, think of it like a tree, a branching tree. Um, and even with vines sometimes connecting these branches, because we know that genes can move between these branches sometimes, like it's messy. Biology is really, really messy. Um, and then when Darwin starts talking about culture and when he starts talking about races and when he starts talking about sex differences, he, he falls back into that ladder thinking. He falls back into a hierarchy. And instead of thinking of all of these cultures in the world as being local solutions to the problems that all the people faced in those environments, and of course they're gonna be different, just like a butterfly is different from a bird, um, instead he begins to think of them hierarchically. And it's disappointing. And it shows to me, what it illustrates to me is, is just the power of bias. That if you're, you know, a, a, a male, you know, if you're an Englishman at this time in the Victorian era, 
you know, during a period of, 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 of colonial expansion, it's hard not to think of your particular group that you're a part of as being the best. Um, and so he very much writes in that way. And it's, it's so fascinating to me. Disappointing is probably the wrong word. Um, disappointing the first time I read it. Now I just find it fascinating and, and revealing and important to recognize that you can, you can be a game changer like Darwin. You can think outside the box and all these different, all these different ways, um, but we're still vulnerable to slipping back into our own into our own biases when it comes to thinking about not butterflies and birds, but thinking about us, thinking about humans. Yeah. By the way, this might be a good question to ask a paleoanthropologist uh, about the concept of race. Is that mm -hmm. a useful scientific concept or not? It's really not. It's really not. Um, what we've what we've been able to figure out both through genetics and and through uh, studying um, populations around the world is that for any trait that you come up with humans exist on a continuum um, and and that any way any way any, any subdivision of humans into categories ends up being completely arbitrary um, so choose a trait you know whether it's blood type or, or height uh, or or you know um, uh, sort of, you know, robusticity, you choose any trait and, uh, or, or, okay, you choose the trait that humans often will put forth as the defining trait for, for race, which, which would be, you know, how, how much melanin you have in your, in your skin and humans exist on, on a, on a continuum. And so if you look at the two endpoints of that continuum and you say, okay, somebody from uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and then somebody from Sweden, are they going to look very different in terms of their melanin profile? Yeah, of course they are. But then look at all the humans that live between those places and they connect the dots. So anywhere you go in any way you think about humans, they exist on, on this, on this continuum. And so in that way, our efforts to subdivide humans into categories is entirely uh, arbitrary. And it's entirely based uh, uh, on on sort of uh, you know the, these these uh, unscientific cutoffs uh, that that people invent. And so one of the things you'll hear us say is that race is a social construct. That race has no biological foundations at all. And that's sort of what I'm just you know saying that every it's a continuum. And so every, any cutoff is arbitrary. Uh, so there's no scientific basis for it. So it's something we've made up. It's a, it's a social construct. But here's the, here's the flip side to that too, is that um, racism ends up having huge biological impacts on people. Um, right. And so by dividing people up and then treating them differently, that then very much does affect their biology. It can affect blood pressure, it can affect stress, it can affect uh, uh, you know, uh, the lifespan uh, ultimately. Um, and so, you know, I'm glad you asked the question because Darwin does have a chapter on, on race and Darwin himself was an abolitionist. Um, Darwin was a progressive thinker, uh, at the time when it came, when it came to, um, these issues, uh, Darwin was up against an argument coming out of, um, Harvard. There was a guy named Louis Agassiz who argued that different races of humans had different origins that we weren't even, you know, that, yeah, sure. We're related to each other, but, but we, but we, you know, we split from different primate species, right? So he wasn't even, even willing to concede that humans were the same species. So Darwin spent a lot of his chapter on races saying, wait a minute here. No, 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 no. Humans are one species. And that at the time was, a, was again, a, a progressive idea consistent with the scientific evidence. But then Darwin does go on to talk about different races of, of humans around the world. And he does it in, in really, really cringing, difficult to read language, uh, where he does not uh, consider uh, people from sub-Saharan Africa uh, to be the equals of people uh, from, from Europe. Um, and so here we have at the time, you know, a progressive thinker uh, 
who is espousing some some you know some some racist concepts. Um, and there have been some arguments. There have been some you know pushbacks on this by by our colleagues saying, he, well, he was a product of his time. Um, okay, but there were plenty of of people from African descent at that time saying, well, this isn't true, <laughs> right? And and he wasn't listening to them. Um, and and he he could have, he he could have. And again, you know, Darwin was an out of the out of the box thinker. But he didn't think out of the box on on, on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. But I mean, with the concept of race being unscientific, how do you account for the anatomical, physiological, perhaps genetic diversity we find across humans from different origins? Do you think that there would be any other uh, scientifically valid concept to account for that and that perhaps could do away with the sort of prejudice that stems from thinking about human biodiversity in terms of racial categories? Yeah, it's a great, great question, Ricardo. So there's, the, there's a concept that was developed um, back in the 1970s known as Kleins. Instead of thinking of humans as being divided up into discrete races, the, instead there is human biological variation all over the world, right? And humans are, are so varied from each other anatomically, physiologically, um, and, and the way we can, we, can, we can account for that is through these clines. And so there is what's called a melanin cline. So the pigmentation you have in your skin, which Darwin wrote about, um, it's, it's highly concentrated around the equator and, and then it, it, it lowers in frequency as you move north and you move south away from the equator. And so that can be best explained uh, through ultraviolet radiation, exposure to the sun. Those individuals who happen to have more melanin close to the equator are going to survive better because that's going to protect the folic acid uh, that is moving through your, your bloodstream. And that's a critical component of growing a healthy baby. As you move farther from the equator, you're getting less exposure to ultraviolet radiation. Um, if you have lots and lots of melanin, you now are not absorbing enough uh, ultraviolet radiation to produce vitamin D. And vitamin D is this critical component in growing skeletons. Um, and so there's this tug of war going on between the melanin you have in your skin, ultraviolet radiation, and what it ends up causing um, is this gradient of browns. You know, humans are brown, right? We, we can be really, really light brown uh, as you are far from the equator, or you can be much darker brown as you get closer to the equator. And we see this, again, it's not, it's not just people in Africa that are close to the equator. You see it in in Southern Asia, you see it in the, the Indian subcontinent, you see it in Indonesia, uh, and you, you see it in, in South America as well. And so the way we sort of are dividing up humans almost continentally uh, doesn't, doesn't mesh at all with this melanin grade, this melanin cline. Um, and so even, even then it's a, it's a bizarre thing that we use skin color at all to categorize humans. But then if you look at blood types, Let's pick another category, say, okay, it's blood types. The Klein looks entirely different, entirely different. And then if you, if you pick something else, some other uh, thing like a, a lactose tolerance, your ability to digest milk, which has been very influenced by culture as well. And it's a biocultural trait of humans, uh, an entirely different Klein. As, uh, than, than, than the melanin one. And so if you, if you come up with you know, 100, 200, 300 different traits that humans have, all right, you can imagine all sorts of ways you can measure humans. They would all have these different clines and now multiply them all together. And that's the biodiversity of humans, right? It's this mishmash. We are this, this gigantic melting pot of, of genes but we fixate on the things we can see. And what we see very often is skin color. And we've been dividing humans up by skin color and you know, maybe a few other, other traits about the hair, and, but the observable characteristics. Um, and, and again, from a biological standpoint, this really doesn't, doesn't, have, uh, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all uh, to, to split up something that exists on a, on a, on a continuum. Um, and yet, you know, it, it persists. So 
Klein would be the word that you and your listeners are, are, are looking for here of how do we understand human biological variation? Because not everyone is the same. Um, and, it, and it's these clients. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's now talk about sexual selection. So uh, how important was the introduction of this idea of sexual selection as another mechanism that was also part of natural selection? I mean, what were some perhaps some of the questions that it would answer that would be left unanswered if we only considered natural selection more generally? Oh, it's a great, great question. So, you know, again, for your for your listeners, Darwin really wrote two books here, um, The Descent of Man and, and then Sexual Selection. And The Descent of Man is what we've been talking about. And it's what, you know, has influenced most of my work. Um, but if, if I was a biologist, if you had a uh, uh, you know, an animal behaviorist on or, or uh, uh, somebody who studies, um, uh, you know, behavior in, in living animals, oh, they'd say, no, 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 descent of man, whatever, sexual selection, that section of the book uh, was, was sheer brilliance. Um, he was able to, uh, you know, Darwin was interested in, in, in why do things work the way they do? He was so mechanistic. And as scientists, you know, that's what we need to do. When we see a correlation between things, we need to say, okay, why does this exist? What is the mechanism explaining why this thing over here is influencing that thing over there? And, you know, in 1859, he came up with the most brilliant mechanism anyone ever had in terms of understanding the diversity of life on earth, and that was natural selection. But he was bothered by the fact that he could not use natural selection to explain certain things. And many of those things were patterned in a in a in in a, a way that um, uh, that overlapped with with the different sexes, and so he would see males looking a certain way and females looking another way uh, across the animal world. And this book, the section of this book, is so beautiful because he talks about insects and he talks about birds and he talks about mammals and he talks about. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the horned and antlered mammals. He talks about primates uh, and then eventually brings it, brings it to humans. Um, and he's able to make all of these beautiful observations uh, that, that he explains uh, through this lens of, of sexual uh, selection. And with sexual selection, it sometimes is antagonistic to natural selection. And the most classic example I mentioned earlier is of course the, the peacock. Uh, and it's a great example for a reason. You've got you know, these feathers that are gonna slow down the animal and make it clear as day to a tiger. You know, peacocks overlap territory with tigers. And they could eat that peacock. You know? So this seems like an idiotic idea to evolve those elaborate feathers, but it works because the females like them. And the females like them in part because some researchers would argue uh, that, that what is being displayed is, is health. Uh, that if you have those kinds of feathers and you are still alive, right? You haven't, uh, you know, that, that you haven't used all your energy on your feathers. You've been able to grow. You've been able, you still can, can make your vocalizations and you haven't been eaten by the tiger. Then you must be something special. So what, one of the things that Darwin really argued was that um, was about female choice, was that females are very much driving some of these uh, anatomies that you see mostly in males. Think about a cardinal, for instance, the brightly colored male cardinal. Um, in primates, we even see it. There's a monkey in Ethiopia called the gelata, where the males have these extraordinary red chests. Uh, and, and once again, it's signaling something about their um, health, we think, uh, or some researchers have proposed, uh, and the females are attracted to that. Um, so Darwin and Wallace argued, you know, as they did you know, through their careers, as good colleagues do, they, they uh, challenged each other and Wallace was not convinced by uh, this female choice argument uh, that Darwin, Darwin was making. Um, so sexual selection kind of flew under the radar for a long time, and it was really a researcher at Rutgers named Robert Trivers in the 1970s uh, that, that wrote some important papers saying, hey, folks, um, Darwin was br beyond brilliant. You all knew he was brilliant, but sexual selection um, is incredibly important. Uh, and in the, you know, the following 50 years, uh, the scientific community 
um, has has recognized just how prophetic Darwin was and the observations he made uh, about the importance of sexual selection. Mm -hmm. But did Darwin also apply sexual selection to humans to try to understand perhaps uh, sex differences, anatomical, psychological? He did. He did. And again, this is where he sort of went off the rails a little bit. Um, look, hum humans are complicated, right? And humans are, are wonderfully varied around the world. And the, the decisions we make are influenced not just by our biology, but by our upbringing and by our, our cultural surroundings. Um, and, and Darwin, I think, I think, you know, intuitively he would know this, um, but I think he oversimplified um, human make choice and ended up making some arguments about, for instance, uh, uh, the, the different skin coloration that we see in humans around the world. He explained that as a sexual selection phenomenon. Um, and, it, and we, we don't think it is, um, there, there's, there's some evidence that maybe that's happening at some levels, uh, but the, the much better explanation is that this is simple, um, uh, run of the mill natural selection, uh, that, that, you know, those individuals with the dark skin close to the equator are going to be able to protect their folic acid and make enough vitamin D. Um, and, and, you know, Darwin wouldn't have known that at the time, but he explained it as a sexual selection phenomenon and we don't think that that's the case um where he where he really st struggled um with his chapter on sex differences was again falling into this um this ranking this this the, uh, you know the value laden language where he you know talks about the difference between uh between uh, men men and women you know, and he says in, in chapter 19 of the book, he said, man is more courageous, pugnacious, and energetic than woman and has a more inventive genius. Um, and, you know, look, I, I, I read Descent of Man, you know, back when I was coll in college. Um, and then I hadn't again for a long time. Um, I, I read it in grad school. And then for this book, I, I reread you know, Descent of Man and several times, but when I first picked it up and I was reading all these brilliant things that Darwin was writing, all, you know, all these things write, being written by somebody I deeply respect. Um, and then you read that. It's hard. You know, it's cringeworthy. It's sort of a, you know, geez, how, how, was, how was such a brilliant mind able to then say something uh, that, that's off base? And yet, yeah, sure, he's, you know, a, he, okay, he's a product of, of, of his time. Um, but again, it shows you the power of bias. And um, there were women at the time telling him this isn't true. <laughs> I mean, my, my favorite example is a woman named Antoinette Brown Blackwell. She wrote a book in 1869 called Studies in General Science. She wrote a book in 1875 called The Sexes Throughout Nature. And she challenged Darwin's ideas of the difference between the sexes. She said, this isn't the case at all. This isn't about uh, sex differences um, and their intellectual abilities. This is about opportunity. This is about access to, uh, to education. You know, that's the problem. It's not a biological difference between the intellect of a, of a, a woman and a, and a man. And Darwin wrote back to her. She sent him a copy of, his, of, the, of her book. And Darwin wrote back to her, and the letter starts, Dear Sir, and then carries on. Um, you know, again, I'm not a Darwin historian. I'm not sure what was going on in his mind at the time, but one way to interpret that would be that uh, he didn't think that a woman would, you know, had written a book. <laughs> it must have been from a, from a man. Um, and so, again, you know, it, it reveals to me the, 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 power, the, the power of bias. Um, and it shows just how important it is to read Descent, because you can read this book now and look at it scientifically and look at all the ways that we can uh, evaluate, you know, the things you got right, the things you got wrong, as we, we do in our book. Um, but also it, it shows you how, you know, one of the most brilliant minds of, of uh, you know, in the last 200 years um, is still is vulnerable to, 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 to bias. And so, so we all are. Right, and it and it and it means a little bit of self-reflection as we're doing our work and 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 writing, putting on paper the things we think. Mm -hmm. But do you think that the things Darwin said about 
race and sex differences, for example, that they are problematic when we look at them through the lens of the kinds of uh, of the kind of social uh, social and cultural context Darwin lived in back then, and the sorts of knowledge we have access to uh, scientific knowledge because I, I mean how developed were disciplines, uh, the social and behavioral disciplines that would allow for us to have a better grasp of yeah. where these sex differences come from, for example, I mean, psychology, anthropology, sociology. I mean, do, do you think that the things he said were particularly problematic or not? Yeah, I do. Um, so, so, you know, here, here's, here's, here's the thing is that he, he had available to him, not all of the information that we have today, today, of course, not all of the, the, the genetic information, the information from psychology and the information from, from anthropology. Um, and, and look, you know, that's been a theme throughout our, our discussion today is that with the information he had at the time, um, he got some things right. He got he got some things wrong. And look, you know, here we are judging what he got what he got right and what he got wrong. Whereas 150 years from now, we're going to be looking back on the things that we think are right, and maybe they're not in, in, entirely spot on either. Um, but where the where things become problematic is that Darwin has been such an influential figure over the last 150 years that you still have people today today who are using the language that Darwin put on paper 150 years ago to justify white supremacy and to justify uh, the, the uh, male superiority. Um, and, 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 you know, that's problematic. And what is problematic? Well, is it the words that Darwin said? To some extent, yes. Um, it's, it's, uh, problematic that you know he had his his daughter Henrietta was smart enough to edit Descent of Man. He had his daughter edit Descent of Man, and and she had to read those words that he thought that a, a woman didn't have the same level of of intellect that she wasn't the inventive genius of of man. Um, and yet he was taking her feedback. He very much did appreciate and respect her feedback and was taking it and incorporating it into the book. And so that takes some serious cognitive dissonance to, you know, have your daughter edit your book that in it you're claiming that women don't, don't have the same intellect as, 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 as men. Um, but the, the, so that's one, one piece of this. I think the other piece of it that becomes problematic is the way we <clears throat> have, um, uh, we hero worship Darwin. And we do it as scientists. Um, look, you know, I, I, I'm guilty of, uh, more guilty of this than, than most people, I think. Um, you know, I went and visited Downhouse. I did uh, the walk along his thinking path. I had chills going down my spine when I did it, thinking that I'm walking on the same rocks that Charles Darwin was walking on. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, and it's be because of all of the brilliant things he, he wrote. But the flip side to that coin is that you also have people looking at these things he wrote and hero worship, wor worshiping those ideas of, mm -hmm. of white supremacy um, and that sub-Saharan Africans are, uh, are, 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 you know, are, are lesser than uh, white male Europeans. Um, and those ideas persist today. Um, would they persist today in the absence of Darwin? I, I think they probably would. Um, but Darwin, for a lot of these folks, is providing the, the scientific underpinnings to their arguments. Um, and that, you know, they're ignoring the fact that science has moved past that, right? And that, and that Darwin was wrong about these things and that we've learned a lot about human diversity. Um, and they're, they're, they're ignoring that and cherry picking the quotes that, that suit their needs. And so in that respect, yes, those words I think are, remain 
enormously problematic. Yeah, I also asked you that because recently I interviewed Agustin Fuentes, one of your co-authors in The Most Interesting Problem, and I think it was on science that he published the recent commentary on Darwin's Descent of Man, and he's very vocal against some of these ideas that Darwin put forth concerning race and sex and so on. And then on the other side, for example, on Jerry Coyne's blog, he responded yeah. to that commentary and said that we have to consider to put things into context and consider the the sort of uh, era Darwin lived in and the ideas they had back then, and that they are not really that problematic. And when it, we consider that context, so I was trying to see where would you fall between those two extremes, I guess. Yeah, uh, Augustine Fuentes' um, essay, right, got a lot of attention. Um, I would recommend to people uh, to, to read the chapter he wrote in this book. The chapter he wrote in this book is a more fleshed out, absolutely brilliant assessment and a fair assessment of Darwin's chapter on, on, on races, because there were things Darwin wrote in that chapter that, that, that were, um, he was, oh, he was so close. He was getting there. He was getting to the point of recognizing that races were arbitrary. He had the, he had the observations um, and he just couldn't get past that point. Uh, and again, it exposes the power of bias. Um, the, the, where, where I think uh, uh, the things have, have again sort of gone off the rails is that people were claiming that Augustine Fuentes was trying to cancel Darwin and cancel <laughs> Descent of Man and it's like, no, 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 we want, I, I think, I think it's a more important book to read than ever, because it not only is a lens through which we can, we can reflect on 150 years of progress scientifically and the things we've discovered. And, and, you know, uh, the, we've talked already about the fossils and about animal behavior and about brains. Um, but we can also use it as a lens through which to, to think about the humanity of science, that science is done by people and people have biases and those biases then influence interpretations and those interpretations end up being somewhat problematic or enormously problematic 150 years later. Um, and so as a practicing scientist now, um, I think about these things more than I did before I was reading Descent of Man and then reflecting on it and participating in this book, A Most Interesting Problem. Um, it, is, it has been a valuable experience for me. It's not a canceling of Darwin. It's, it's, a, it's an expansion of Darwin into this, into this additional sort of realm of thinking about scientists as fallible people. Um, and, and the importance of, of then having a community of scientists made up of different voices uh, who, are, who are sort of, you know, fact checking you a little bit and saying, wait a minute here, that language is problematic, what you just said, or what you just said is a misinterpretation of these data through that lens that you have through your own lived experiences because you have this bias. So we all as scientists can benefit, I think, from, you know, reading Darwin not like we're reading a sacred text, but reading Darwin like we're reading a series of hypotheses presented by a brilliant scientist who was a human being. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so can we say that the descent of men uh, add any di direct downstream political and social effects? Um, uh, un un unfortunately, yes, um, you know, and, and again, it, it comes back to um, it comes back to that idea of of Darwin, you know, if you, if you ask a person on the street, um, you know, name a famous scientist, living or dead, um, the name Darwin's going to come up a lot. You're going to get Charles Darwin coming up a lot, a lot, a lot. And if you then present that person or a group of people with some of the words that are in Descent of Man, that can be used as, look, this brilliant scientist said it, and therefore, 
it can be used as as justification for some some horrific uh, uh, acts that that humans will will you know perpetuate on one another. Now, might those have happened anyway? Uh, uh, absolutely, um, but but Darwin's words have been used and misused in order to justify uh, some things that, that, you know, awful things that humans have done to each other um, in, the, in the 20th and into the 21st uh, century. And so, yeah, it has become um, a, a book of interest to people that, that want to um, cherry pick the language and, 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 and use and misuse his words to justify the things they're, they're, they're doing. Um, and I don't think Darwin, you know, knowing what I know about him and, and all of the letters I've read, and again, I'm not a Darwin historian, but I think he'd be, I think he'd be horrified by that. Um, I think it would, it would be deeply unsettling to him um, that his words were, were used in this manner. Mm -hmm. So just one last question and to try to sum things up a little bit before we go and in reference to the uh, subtitle of your book, What Darwin's Descent of Man Got Right and Wrong About Human Evolution, uh, without being exhaustive, what would you say were the ideas that he got right and wrong the most? Uh, well, what we've been talking about is what he got wrong the most. Um, is the, the establishment of human races and language that he used in which he treated human groups uh, hierarchically. Um, and, and then, of course, with, with sex differences, the same thing. Um, we're treating um, men and women, or women as, as inferior uh, to men. Um, I, I would highly recommend to your listeners uh, Angela Saini's books, Superior and Inferior, uh, that go into these two topics in much more detail and how uh, not just Darwin, but the scientific community um, has perpetuated some of these ideas through time. Um, it, you know, and science is self-correcting. And so that's what we do. We do as, as the evidence gathers and shows that we were wrong. Uh, we, we, we modify and shift gears and, and, and that's what, you know, there's a, a correction, a course correction happening in, in the scientific community right now. Um, what did Darwin get right? Oh, Darwin nested humans within the great diversity of life on Earth, um, that we are part of something much bigger than us, uh, that we're part of something really, really extraordinary, uh, that all life on Earth, I mean, how, how profound is this, that every living thing on Earth, from the trees outside my window to the squirrels climbing in them, uh, to all the people around me, uh, to, to ants and, and monkeys and bacteria and birds and butterflies that we are all related, that we're cousins of one another. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant and beautiful idea. And it started with Origin of Species and with Descent of Man, he, he carried on and, and demonstrated to people that... Um, we are one of evolution's great experiments uh, that all of the things that we celebrate about being human um, are, are the result of, of evolution by means of natural selection or sexual selection, as he introduced in, in the book. Uh, but one of the last great things that I'll say is that what Darwin proposed that others were just hinting at was that the origins and evolution of humans was knowable that this is something we can actually figure out using science, using, using evidence. Um, and he started us on this great path that 150 years later, we're, we're still on. We're still trying to figure out all of the, um, uh, the, 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 the great history of, of humans and why we are the way we are. We've answered a lot of questions. We figured out a lot of this, but we still have many, many more to answer. Um, and I think we're, we're up to the task. Okay, great. So the book is again a most interesting problem. What Darwin's descent of man got right and wrong about human evolution. Uh, Dr. De Silva, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the internet? Yeah, so I, I have a, a WordPress website. Um, so if you just Google my name, Jeremy De Silva, you'll find um, my website and 
uh, uh, my my papers and and lectures and and uh, uh, you know these books are are uh, or at least where to get these books are uh, posted there. Um, and then I have a Twitter handle as well. It's uh, De Silva um, underscore Jerry, uh, and you can you can follow me there. Okay, great. So, Dr. De Silva, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Ricardo. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching the interview until the end. Please do not forget to support the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. So you have links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. For even just $1 per month, you can support the show and get access to all the goodies I have to for you in Patreon. Uh, and you also have links to PayPal, of course. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzka and Blanchett Perlager Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford and Frederick Sunda. Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Miller, Herbert Kintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuburger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Paulo Sandro Ban, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavan, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omri Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrink, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weyda, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila de Zaraujo, Eden Solon, Roman Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, my producer, Zizar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stefiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sérgio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegnam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, and Nirvan Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.